Hey, I was born in Canton, China, <clears throat> moved to Hong Kong at a very young age, and immigrated to the uh, United States at the age of eight, nine years old. Uh, my father did not think I was going to survive in the, uh, in the neighborhood. He had a concern. He took me down to Chinatown one day to have his friend teach me Chinese martial art, or Kung Fu. So I went on to win the uh, New York City Golden Gloves Boxing Championship. First Asian to win that honor. Uh, there was a movie company who offered me a uh, movie contract. I thought it over, and I chose law over acting. My father, who had come to the United States in 1937 as a teenager, came to serve in the United States Army Air Forces. Following the conclusion of World War II, uh, he returned to China to find a bride. That's how I happened to be born there. I came to the United States at the age of six months. Of course, um, at that time, um, Chinese Americans were limited in the occupations they could pursue. So he opened, um, as his father before him had done, a laundry and cleaning store in Queens. And speaking to the lawyers and the judges who were, who were customers um, in my father's business, they, um, they told me very gently that there probably would not be a career for me in the law. I uh, was undaunted by that, of course, because that was the, uh, the era of civil rights. And I thought that perhaps that might be a barrier that I could break down. And I was born and raised in Baldwin, Long Island, uh, to a couple who uh, were both transplants. Neither of my parents ever finished high school. There were no books in my house. No one read books. And I discovered the library. So I was really the first person in my entire family to ever go to college and complete a college education. And luckily, NYU gave me a scholarship, and I worked my way through law school. I was one of seven children. Uh, we had six kids, two adults in the upper flat with three bedrooms and one bath. I think by, because there were so many kids in the house, um, the idea was graduate from high school and get to work. And so I was the first one in the family to go to college. And that was difficult because we didn't know any lawyers. Uh, and so it was a bit of a challenge to try and figure that out. The, the other challenge, of course, was working uh, my way through college. You know, I um, uh, worked in uh, machine shops and factories. Uh, I took a year off between college and, and law school to make money to pay for law school. I can go back to a high school teacher who uh, had us read some case law. And I saw how judges wrote decisions and how it really impacted uh, 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 you know, people's lives. I was hooked. I was uh, handing resumes out at law firms trying to find a job my first year of law school. And uh, I, I'll never forget, I walked up to a window and uh, the receptionist had a glass door, uh, slid it open. And um, I handed her the resume, you know, which of course had nothing in it. Um, and uh, a young uh, partner of the firm was walking by, and he looked at me, saw me hand her the resume, and said, are you looking for a law clerk job? And I said, yes. He said, come on in, I'll give you an interview. And that was Eugene F. Pickett, Jr., uh, now retired oh Court of Appeals judge. I had a second grade English teacher who was so extraordinary and had so much faith in me. In fact, when I was sworn in as family court judge in Ulster County, she came to the swearing in. While my father wanted me to continue my education, he died when I was only 13 years old, so he really couldn't provide me with much guidance in that area. I went to college uh, during the Vietnam War era. I became involved in protest movements and saw my friends getting arrested and realized that lawyers were their saviors. Uh, one person who um, I'm particularly fond to remember is uh, the Honorable Charles W. Frosell. And with his encouragement, I received my first um, introduction to, uh, to persons who could uh, help me in my legal career. I was the first um, Asian American assistant district attorney in New York State history through an introduction by Judge Frosell. I found uh, a hospitable environment in the Queens DA's office. He was trying to build a diverse office. He had um, women assistants. He had um, assistants of color. And uh, I found that uh, I was very compatible with the environment there in the, the court at that time. When I grew older, I learned that uh, the law touches pretty much on everything that we do in life. 
and I saw my father was very active in the uh, community with the uh, community work. And every project that we did, uh, law was always involved. And that's how I got interested in uh, law and my desires to, uh, to enter law school. We now have before you the presiding justices of the four appellate divisions. Let's for a moment pause and notice what the administrative board now looks like. The chief judge, Janice DeFiori, is a female, and this is the administrative board. It's a diverse administrative board, which clearly reflects the communities we serve across the state of New York. Well, it's an interesting blend that we have here in the second department, because of course we have three of the boroughs of the city of New York, and uh, they have the um, inner city issues that uh, we find all over the city of New York. We also have uh, suburban issues. We have uh, rural issues from our, uh, our northern, our eastern counties. So we are a, um, uh, a blend. The uh, first department sits uh, pretty much uh, the, in the, the uh, financial center of the, uh, of the world. And we do get a good number of uh, commercial cases. Uh, uh, each year we hear about 500 to 600 commercial cases. What I love about our state is that we're all so different. It's because, of course, geographically, we're 28 counties. We have a massive geographic area. Judge Peters uh, uh, Court the Third has kind of the same geographic uh, uh, makeup as we do. And so there are sometimes uh, different uh, issues that, that we may have a different view on. What about the time? Is there a bell or a white light, or does the JP go like that to no, stop? We, How does we it do, work? The first department do have if, a like. Uh, a light. Uh, if we set it for six minutes, the uh, the clock is set for six minutes, and then there's a white light that goes on, which means you have two minutes left. How tough are well, you with the red light? Well, in the second light? department, um, we do not have lights at all. We don't have red <laughs> nor white lights, nor do we have. Um, timers or... You have only a trap door. <laughs> yes, that's essentially it, yes. In the fourth department, we don't have the lights or, or anything like that, um, it, but we do have a set time for the argument. The attorneys that come to us know ahead of time exactly how much time they have for oral argument. We allow rebuttal from the appellant, and they're told ahead of time if they want to reserve time for rebuttal, it's taken out of their argument time. Mm. And I'm a pretty rigid timekeeper, to be perfectly candid. Now, do you have a light or do you No, do I have a clock. As far as arguing, I, I do think it's important, and, and uh, I think it's important especially in cases where our court may know that there's going to be a disagreement between the judges before we take the bench. And then if all of a sudden you're up on, on the bench and, uh, and one of the parties submits at the last minute, and that was the party that maybe one faction of the bench wanted to hear from in support of where they thought the case should go, and they're not there to argue it. Mm. That can sometimes have an impact on the deliberations. Somewhat annoying is uh, uh, the number of, uh, of counsel who request time and, uh, and either don't appear uh -huh. uh, and, or, or don't to notify the adversaries and just, you know, just leaving everyone uh, in that sort of uh, a vacuum thing, it would make for uh, better calendar control and, and more efficiency. I, I really have to echo this, this no-show problem because it's so, it's so important. You know, if in our court, if you say on the brief you're orally arguing and we tell you by, by looking up at our website on the calendar how much time you've given, we prepared to hear from you. You know, we've read the briefs, we've read the records, we're, we have questions, we're interested. And when you don't show, without calling the other side and without calling the court, you've insulted your colleague. And you've also insulted the court. The attorneys, according to us, would prefer to be asked questions the entire time than to stand there and speak with the judges not mm. asking a question, mm. because from their point of view, that means they've either lost or their case is too boring. I couldn't agree more uh, with, with Justice uh, um, Peters that what we do um, when we're asking questions is we're drilling down on the issues. And my, uh, what I get back from the lawyers is that they like that very much. 
and because they get right to the heart of the argument. We don't want to hear about all the facts of the case and to have them, their time taken up with that because we know the facts of all the cases that are, on our, that are before our panel. And we, want to go, we want to know what their argument is. They're making their argument in response. It's not like we're taking their argument away. Their argument's being made in a give and take with the court. One of the members of the court may ask a question and before the answer is actually given out, another member of the court may ask another question on top of that question. And I have lawyers ask me, what do you do with that? Right. right? Yeah. And, and I think it, it, it depends upon the lawyer and, and their ability to finesse that. Uh, and some are better than others. But I, but I, and you certainly don't say, I'll get to you later. Oh, no. When we have that, the presiding yeah. judge, usually the lawyer <laughs> looks to the PJ. That's what we're doing right now. Yeah. Right? The exactly. Lawyer, you look goes, to the justice presiding. The JP. Yeah. The JP yeah. The presiding should, goes, should be. How do you want me to deal with this? Should be, yes, uh, uh, putting things in order. I mean, that's right. what I, that's what I would Yeah, it's really up to the JP to control yeah. the bench. Right. Rather fundamental that you lead in your brief with your strongest point. And sometimes, you know, you are looking at the first two points or so, and then you have counsel saying, well, I rest on my brief on points one and two, but I really want to get and tell you about number three over here. So that, you know, can sometimes tell you that either they haven't really organized it well. well sometimes the, the lawyer that writes the brief is not the lawyer making the oh, argument. Oh, that too. <laughs> the lawyer who makes the argument yes. reads the brief and says, hmm, I wouldn't have put one and That's two, one and also. two. Yes. Uh, and, and the court sometimes will get, will get a case, and they'll seize upon three or four. And that will, be the, that will be where the court wants to be. But there is nothing more frustrating, I think, for us, is when an attorney comes in to argue a case who doesn't know the case as well as we do, because he or she got sent, you know, yeah. cover for John. Well, you know, you either submit or you be prepared. Recognizing that this is going to be seen decades from now, are there any thoughts you want to convey uh, to uh, the people who are watching it and even to future generations. Arguments uh, is important. You should argue, argue your case because you could persuade a judge uh, uh, to change uh, his or her mind uh, through argument. Uh, we know the facts and you don't have that much time to argue. So get to the issue directly because uh, that is more persuasive than anything else. My thinking is that um, civility needs to be preserved at all levels, and that is uh, civility uh, by counsel, civility by those who are on the bench. We seem to be um, in an era now where uh, norms of civility seem to be shifting. I, I don't know how many times a bench that I've sat on is addressed by counsel as, you guys. Uh, we, have, um, we have counsel that uh, sometimes are uh, are, are rather abrasive to each other. I, I think that that, of course, will um, undermine the, um, the argument that you're making. It'll undermine your credibility uh, with the court, and uh, that's not why we're here. Um, but with an eye towards the, the audience, uh, not in our, currently uh, with us, but rather the future audience. I would say, future audience, you're looking at judges that actually get together in person. In our court, we have judges who will drive from Buffalo to Rochester, judges that will drive from Syracuse <clears throat> to Rochester, and, and we will be deliberating on cases in person together. I suspect that the future watchers of this uh, film will be, uh, it'll all be digital, and it'll all be not in person. This way that we're handling this work uh, is, uh, is a little different than what they'll uh, be experiencing, but it has a lot of value, I think, in terms of getting together as people and, and, and resolving these uh, um, cases as people talking to each other in one room. Each day I wake up and I am so <clears throat> grateful for the opportunity I have to be the presiding justice of the Appellate Division Third Department and to have been a judge for as long as I have. And what we do as a court, resolve disputes by peaceful means. And that's an amazing thing to do in this day and age when so many disputes are resolved in ways that we wouldn't describe as peaceful. Right. That that's what justice is. It's the resolution of disputes by peaceful means. What we want is good, good lawyering, good legal reasoning, and respect for the law. Well, that is so reassuring to hear, and it's so good to know that the themes that you've outlined here, aside from the bread and butter, are the themes of industry and civility. Thank you very much.
growing up in uh, Hong Kong, the uh, word for America in Chinese is gum san. Gum is go and san is mountain. So the uh, literal translation of America is go mountain. When I arrived at the airport, I was anxious to see all these little go mountains. I saw no go, but I saw a lot of crack and broken sidewalks, buildings with graffiti. I later learned that uh, Go Mountain was a metaphor, and that uh, the term Go Mountain or Gum San stood for the vast opportunities in this country, and that if one works hard and perseveres, there's nothing that one cannot achieve or accomplish. What's your favorite movie? If I had to name one as I'm sitting here now, I would say Amistad. Uh, I think that whole story, it just uh, resonated with me, how important the courts are to real problems. Interestingly enough, I, uh, I am something of a romantic, and uh, I, I've always liked Casablanca. You know, I have a favorite movie. I'm not so sure if it reflects what I'm about, but I think it reflects the American dream. And it's a movie that my son and I watch every single year at Christmas and have since he was a young child. And it's, it's a wonderful life. One of my favorite movies uh, is The Good Earth. It was uh, Pearl Buck, 1937. It really depicted the uh, life in uh, China back at the turn of the uh, 19th century. It was just a magnificent film and uh, I watch it over and over.